Greetings, I'm Joel Rosenthal, President of Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome Elbridge Colby to the Council for a discussion of his new book, The Strategy of Denial. Um, Bridge has been part of the Carnegie Council family for many years now, and we've had a long running conversation about, about realism and what it means to be a realist uh, a realist with a moral compass. So I'd like to talk about some of that this morning on the occasion of the publication of your book. Um, just uh, just by way of introduction, quickly a few a few highlights of Bridge's career. Um, he's been Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, and during that time, he was responsible for parts of the 2018 National Security Strategy document. Um, he's been a fellow at. Uh, CNAS, the Center for New American Security. Um, he's now principal of the Marathon Initiative, and of course, the author of this new book, The Strategy of Denial. So, uh, Bridge, I wanted to just start off by giving you an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the origin of the book. Uh, why this book? Why now? And maybe just give us a little context, and then we'll dig in. Sure. Well, great. Thanks, Joel. It's wonderful to be with you and, and to be able to talk uh, at, at the Carnegie Council, which is such an important uh, and unique uh, uh, work and, and institution at the intersection of, of foreign policy in a very serious way, but also uh, the critical moral and ethical issues uh, that invariably arise and, and does so in such a, I think, a, such a serious way. So, so delighted to be here. Um, the motivation for the book, uh, kind of in the briefest sense, is my profound concern about a mismatch between um, not so much what our strategic documents actually say, but the way we behave as a nation and the sort of power realities of the world. And that basically is, is what you might think of as the economists might put a condition of scarcity, which is to say, unlike 20 or 25 years ago, we cannot uh, realistically or reasonably uh, think that we can essentially cover all of the potential threats we might face in the world. Uh, uh, through our own resources and maybe some contribu minor contributions from our allies. We're now in a world where, you know, we're very, very powerful. We're one of the two superpowers, but we're not so dominant as we once were. And that's not a self-flagellating comment. That's just a reality. And in that context, you really need a strategy, in my view. So a, and a strategy is, in a sense, is a framework. It's a heuristic, if you will, to uh, decide what you need to focus on and what you need to focus on less, where you allocate your resources, what risks you run, what risks you don't need to run. And our national conversation, unfortunately, I, I think in some ways we continue to see it even now with the Ukraine tragedy, uh, in discipline in how we think about that. And, and what I wanted to do, and you could think of it in, in, in a way that's analogous to a business or even a family facing a, a difficult situation, is let's look at the world as it is, the threats that we face, which are real and, and at least in some respect manifold. But let's also look at the resources we have and the potential strategies we can adopt to deal with those threats in a realistic a, a way. And, and that's what I wanna do more than anything else. And it's particularly important in matters of war and peace because it involves life and death and life and death in, in, in large numbers, potentially very large numbers. And of course we wanna avoid that, but we wanna avoid that in ways that, that meet our, our core interests. And, and that's that's the purpose of the book is to, is to lay out in a kind of clear and hopefully concise and accessible way, what our geopolitical strategy is and then what the military strategy we need to substantiate that that overall foreign policy strategy. Great. So Hans Morgenthau liked to say that the way we define our interests or the way we should define interests is in terms of power. And so, um, and I, in your book, you take up this idea of how do we define America's core interests? And I just want to read a couple of sentences, and maybe you can elaborate. Um, you say America's core interest is in preventing the hegemony of any other state over a key region of the world. And the main threat to that interest is China and Asia. And then you go on to say all alliances and other defense commitments should be made, retained, deferred, or exited in light of this priority. So my question is, am I right? Is that, is that the core idea of your book? And if so, could you just elaborate on that a little bit and how you sort of got there? Well, yeah, I would say actually, in some sense, the core idea I'm, is, is Morgenthau's. I, I'm, I'm writing in the shadow of a few authors. I mean, everybody is, uh, what a Keynes line, a slave to some defunct economist. Uh, 
Well, everybody, you know, is a slave to some defunct strategy. There are a few things that are genuinely new under the sun. And I'm definitely writing in the shadow of Morgenthau, as well as people like uh, Clausewitz and uh, Tom Schelling and <clears throat> um, Nicholas Spikeman, you know, Robert Gilpin, you could probably say. Uh, these are the sort of the, the influences that, that you know, I, I derive from um, and, and kind of the same mindset, uh, if you will. And that the core thing that you mentioned is, is this, the central salience of power. And that is the most important thing uh, that I think the, the book is, is grounded on, which is the book is looking, okay, how do we defend the American people's security, prosperity, and liberty? Well, the thing to focus on in that context is power. It's not intent at some particular time. It's not uh, necessarily you know, any other, other, other factors that you might look at. Those, are, those may be important, but the basic thing that we need to concentrate on is agglomeration of power. And I actually think this is a very American idea because this, in a sense, the central idea of American political system, the American political system is the separation of powers. It's that nobody, you know, the Madisonian idea, nobody can be trusted with too much power. And that's the thing that we want, that we must fear because intentions change. You know, I mean, it's this, it's the, the, the old, the old cliches of the realist tradition, but there are cliches for region, you know, the Crow memorandum that you can't, you know, you don't know if intentions will change, but if you have a lot of power, it's much more, uh, it's much more possible to pursue aggressive strategies. And it's more likely because it becomes more tempting. And that gets into the sort of human nature, uh, uh, sort of aspect of, of traditional realism that I'm very much in in the tradition of. And, and, you know, if we look at that, the central deduction of the book is that China is by far the most significant challenge that we have to face for two reasons. One is that China is going to be about 20 to 25 percent of global GDP, which is a rough, imperfect imp imp approximation of power, but probably better than the alternatives. Um, and Asia is the world's most important area, uh, which is about it's going to be roughly half of global GDP and probably growing. And China is in Asia. You know, it's not necessary. I mean, the United States is a superpower, but is in a relatively weak region, but China's not. And so, and I mean, I think we can see that China is in fact pursuing something like regional hegemony and possibly more. So that needs to be our uh, prime goal. And there's no other threats, including Russia and Europe, that can plausibly threaten that. Europe is considerably less significant than Asia. It is very significant. And Russia is much weaker than China. As, as menacing and danger, dangerous and, and, and nasty as, as, as the Russian government is. And also the Europeans are more capable of balancing Russia. And we're seeing that happen right now. And so the mindset is to try to, okay, that's the basic idea. Well, let's, how do we, how do we array our resources and efforts to, to prevent that outcome while also serving our, our secondary interests? Just because an interest is secondary doesn't mean you ignore it, but it does mean you prioritize the primary interests. Right. So uh, we're being tested in real time here. And I understand this is a recorded event. Uh, but for those of us, for those of you who will be listening at a later time, this is being recorded on uh, March 11, uh, 2022. So uh, we're being tested and all being tested in your theories being tested in real time with what's happening in Ukraine. So could you share some of your thoughts about what we're seeing there, how your how your sort of theory um, informs what the appropriate response should be from an American defense and foreign policy perspective. Sure. Well, first, let me say, and I think it's important, especially, you know, speaking as a realist that, um, you know, uh, you wrote a, a wonderful book called Righteous Realist. And uh, there's a great quote uh, attributed to, I think it's Walter Lippmann talking to Morgenthau saying, you're not the cold, heartless realist that people paint you. You're actually the most moral man I know. And I think the point I would like to say in that vein is that we should absolutely condemn and abhor uh, Moscow's behavior in Ukraine. It's abominable. Um, but the idea of Morgenthau, I think, and the, the logic of that is that moral condemnation uh, absent or, or detached from power realities is, almost, is not only feckless, it can be actually counterproductive. And I think, you know, Morgenthau had the experience, of course, personally of being driven from Europe by the Nazis effectively and, you know, losing his whole his family, his, his livelihood, et cetera, uh, and making his life in a new country, much to our benefit, uh, uh, of course. But, um, but, but that the idea is, let us think about the consequences of our, of our policies and our actions in order to avoid this outcome credibly. That is the real moral goal. And I think the, the thing I would stress, Joel, is that, and, and it's very salient right now, is there are a lot of people making very 
dramatic policy recommendations motivated by a kind of moral fervor, which is uh, sometimes I, I, I think even verges on, on posturing or, or peacocking, if you will, a kind of a form of moral theater. When we're talking about nuclear weapons, major war in Europe, uh, profound consequences, and the potential for disaster in Asia as well. And so I think it's, it's even more important that we think in a realistic way. Uh, because if anything, what this invasion, abominable invasion has told us is that war is possible and a revisionist authoritarians will employ dr dramatic dominant military force if they think their incentives are in that, in that direction. Right. And so it's, it's actually, it's all, it's critical that we think in, in a realistic way. So in that right. vein, um, what do I think, what do I think we should do? Well, first of all, I, I don't think anything that the Russians have done has changed the fundamental power factors. So, I mean, my view is that we should, you know, aid the Ukrainians in their fight. We should strengthen NATO by arming up and encouraging the, the defense increases of the Europeans. We should have intelligence sanctions on the Russians and we should pursue energy independence. Um, but we should prioritize Asia. In fact, we need to prioritize Asia even more because the power realities have not changed at all. And if anything, and I'm, I'm cautious about saying this, and you say this is a reported event, we don't know how the military campaign will go. I, I'm, I tend to be a bit skeptical about some of the uh, very negative assessments of the Russian military's performance. Clearly, I think it's at this point, it's indisputable that Moscow expected things to go better, but we are only about two weeks in. And, you know, the Russians are, do appear to be bringing in mass and they do enjoy significant military overmatch in a lot of a lot of respects. So we will see how this goes. But if the Russian military actually is underperforming relative to expectations in, and is diminishing some of its, you know, for instance, stocks of munitions and, and important capabilities, if anything, that actually makes a shift to Asia all the more feasible. I mean, again, I would I would advocate it under any circumstances, but we have two fundamental things going on. We have the Russians getting bogged down and having difficulty in Ukraine. And more importantly, we have the Europeans finally stepping up. So the critical sort of argument that I make is in Europe, we can take more risk because the Europeans are there and they have more latent capacity. And finally, most significantly, the Germans are spending 100 billion extra dollars this year, excuse me, euros on their, their military. The Poles have gone to 3%, the Romanians have gone to 2.5%, the Danes, the Swedes, others are increasing defense spending. This is the, this is the, the basis for strong European NATO defense in which the United States remains engaged, but focuses on Asia. So unfortunately, I don't know that that's where we're gonna go, sadly, but that's where I think logic leads and that's where the interests of the American people lead. So let's look now toward the Pacific, having just talked a little bit about Europe. So what is your assessment of the situation now from an American defense perspective? Um, you wrote a piece recently in Time Magazine um, about this. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Well, I think the military situation uh, and thus our geopolitical situation is very grave and in fact deteriorating. So there's, there's, there, there, for reasons that remain somewhat opaque to me, there's still a sense that we can't actually be beaten by the Chinese. And I don't think that's correct at all. In fact, a lot of military audiences, uh, there's almost a, in some quarters, there's almost a, a throwing up the hands kind of uh, situation. And China's first target uh, for breaking apart what I call, think of as an anti-hegemonic coalition in Asia is Taiwan, which uh, while we have a politically ambiguous situ uh, sort of position on uh, from a uh, defense planning point of view, I think is effectively within our defense perimeter. And from public statements of defense officials and military officers, we know that we are getting beaten uh, in war games going forward uh, and the situation is deteriorating. Uh, the Chinese increased their defense spending just earlier this month. I think it was announced by over over 7%. Um, again, <laughs> so in the midst of an of COVID slowdown, economic slowdown that they're facing. Um, and they, of course, have advantages of scale and proximity and focus that we don't. So um, we actually need to be increasing our prioritization on Asia rather than going with inertia or the status quo, uh, because we're significantly vulnerable in a lot of ways. And the problem, Joel, in Asia is that um, China is half basically of the GDP or what have you, power of Asia. So it, 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 there's no buffer in the way that the, 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 tragic, the tragic fate of the Ukrainians has, has provided the Germans effectively with uh, a buffer so that they could decide mm -hmm. after Ukraine was invaded to go to 2%. It would have been better for the Germans to have done that before and maybe avoided this outcome. 
But if Taiwan falls, the, the, the geopolitical and military situation in Asia will be ex exceptionally acute. And, you know, Japan is a lot smaller than the Chinese economy, even and let alone the other countries. So um, it's, you know, and I think, look, if we learn anything from what's happened in Ukraine, it's that, as I said, that, that you know, Putin and the Kremlin invested a lot of money in restoring the Russian conventional military. They clearly telegraphed significant concern or interest in Ukraine. And eventually we had an invasion. And, you know, the Chinese have invested a lot of money in shaping the People's Liberation Army for the Taiwan fight. And they've telegraphed very clearly their willingness to use force against Taiwan. So I think we should take them at their word and be prepared in order to avoid it. Right. So a big part of your book is about alliances. Um, and so one read of what's happening in Europe now, we'll see, but could be a success, which is that NATO is becoming, you know, finding itself again and becoming reinforced and so on with the United States playing its role. Um, you know, um, we could discuss what that role is, if it's a balancer or if it's a leader, whatever, but it's playing an important role. But what I wanted to ask you about was more about the alliances in the Pacific. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of activity there with AUKUS, the Quad, so on. So, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about where you see sort of the alliance structure going, um, sort of in how the United States is doing and what it should be doing moving forward. Sure. Well, in the book, I really focus it around um, what I call an anti-hegemonic coalition, which is more of a, a model, a conceptual model, rather than a kind of Procrustean idea that we need to fit everything into. And I think the idea here is I talk a lot about alliances, but it's in a in this kind of same spirit of realism, which is that alliances um, are instruments of national interest, uh, not in a zero sum or kind of nasty way. But um, there's been a tendency. In fact, the president you know, refers to our uh, commitment to NATO, for instance, as sacred. And my view is the sacred obligation of the president, and the government is to the American people. And of course, we have a very strong and important commitment to Europe uh, and to NATO. But it's ultimately an instrument. And so I, I mean, the analogy I use is um, we need to think of our alliances less as sort of almost like love affairs. There's like a romantic quality to it and more as like a, a, a like I think of it as like a private business partnership. Like if you go into business with somebody like your accounting firm or law firm or something and it's a private business, there is a strong personal overlay. Uh, you know, you're, you're, there's, you might socialize as, as families, but at the end of the day, everybody's supposed to pull their weight and it's supposed to serve a common you know, interest, which is putting food on the table and, you know, sending your kids to you know, vacation or camp or whatever. Um, so that's how we should, we should, we should look at these things, but always with the, the model of a kind of an enlightened self-interest. And um, in Asia, I think what we want is this coalition, which is essentially a balancing coalition that works sufficiently effectively to check Beijing's aspirations for regional dominance. This is not an Asian NATO. I, I'm actually, I'm not against an Asian NATO, although I'm very skeptical that it would be uh, actually what we worth it, um, because that would be a tremendous amount of, of capital invested in a kind of symbolic organization or, or sort of like the sort of overt organization, whereas really what we want is is actually capability and, and, and resolve. And that's, you know, India, for instance, might not want an alliance. And actually, that's great in a lot of ways because they're willing to pull their own defense weight. They don't want a, a security guarantee from America. Great. OK. Well, different in Japan, Taiwan, I think on the whole, this anti-hegemonic coalition is going pretty well. And, you know, frankly, we have Xi Jinping to thank for that. Um, that's good news. The bad news is that Beijing can see this and can adapt accordingly and pursue strategies to try to short circuit or inhibit or, or, or collapse it ultimately. And that's kind of, I think, where we're heading in the next couple of years is I don't think we should be spiking the football over things like AUKUS and uh, the Quad. Th those are good, but you know it's sort of the paradox of strategy. Good news can lead to a counter move that, that actually increases the danger. It doesn't mean you don't do it, but you got to account for that and, and, and remain a step ahead. So I want to talk a little bit more about, about this idea of coalition and alliance. And you have a chapter in the book towards the end called the binding strategy, right? And you're thinking about well, what what holds the the coalition or the alliance together? And um, as we we talked about this before, right? The, so the essential element is likely to be fear, right? There's something feared, and there's a common interest around that. But I wanted to just push you a little bit. Um, are you are you satisfied that it's it's just you know fear of a of a of 
an aggressor or whatever, or is, is there another, is there another dimension to it, which might go to values, um, commonly held values, or is that, is that the wrong direction from your point of view and thinking about what, what will bind us together in coalitions? Well, I am of the view that <clears throat> what, what really is most important, I mean, as Hobbes said, the passion to be reckoned upon is fear. And I think that's the right mm -hmm. mindset when you're thinking about, um, alliances, which are ultimately tools of war and peace and therefore involve, uh, um, you know, potential, uh, death, you know, people dying in large numbers and so forth, we really got to be clear in our heads. I think what I would say, is, and I think kind of what, what you're suggesting, I think in Asia, um, yeah, well, here's what I'll say. Fear is not an immoral um, or amoral emotion because the fear or passion, the fear is of the things that, that a country highly values. And frankly, I think we see that in Ukraine, the fear of the molestation or aggression against one's own country, one's own family, one's own community. That is a moral duty. And that is a, a, a that has a moral quality. And I'd go, go a little bit beyond that because in Asia in particular, well, not in particular, I think in Asia, out, particularly outside of Europe, nationalism and national autonomy and, and independence are not bad words. I mean, in Asia, nationalism is associated with the anti-colonial movements um, and the ejection of the, of the European powers. So it's a good thing, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the standing up of the people, including the Chinese people, by the way, uh, the standing up of the Asian people and the, the assumption of a independent and strong national life and a place in the, in, in the world. So I think that's the sort of, to me, and that's when I always liked the term free and open Indo Indo-Pacific, because it was saying, look, there's a kind of ecumenical quality to it in terms of who's, you know, who's uh, welcome in this coalition. But it's saying, look, you're going to kind of figure out your own national life. And we might have views on, you know, say, obviously, we don't like Vietnam's system of government. But the, the priority here is an anti-hegemonic coalition. And Vietnam deserves to have its own independent course in national life. I hope it becomes a free society and treats its people with more, you know, uh, a dignity and so forth. But the core goal here is to prevent China from dominating us all. And that's, I think, the moral quality. And this is very important, actually. And I think we're actually seeing this right now is that the the Biden administration, I think the president has a different view and people like, like Secretary of State Blinken, that there has to be this positive idea, which is kind of the rules-based international order or democracy or something. I mean, a couple of things. <laughs> One, that's going to that's going to cause problems in Asia. And if you read people like my friend Ashley Townsend from Australia, that, that, that doesn't travel well. Because if you look at the Freedom House rankings, for instance, in South and Southeast Asia, there, there are no country, there's no country that is green. I mean, I'm not saying they're perfect judges, but it gives you sort of a sense. So if, if that's your central message, you might get Luxembourg and Denmark, but you're not going to get Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia or India even, right? I mean, so that causes you real problems. Um, and the other thing is, I think it's 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 a built on a, a bit of a foundation of sand, which is, and I think, frankly, we're seeing this with Ukraine right now. The Ukrainians are fighting for their own homes and freedom mm -hmm. and their own independence. They're not fighting for an abstract rules-based international order. And by the way, the Germans increasing their defense spending, they didn't respond to pleas for the rules-based international order over the last year. What, what Chancellor Schultz said in his in his speech was that they were responding to a threat to themselves, basically, mm -hmm. an increased threat. And, and, and that's the Poles, for instance, whom the administration has not been particularly fond of, leading, this, leading the charge. Well, because Ukraine's their neighbor and they fear Russia very directly for very good reasons. So I think this is both more a sounder foundation to build upon. And I think it's, I think it's moral. You know, I think it's something that we can, we can there, there's a strong moral foundation for it. So I'm going to ask you to say a little bit more about that. In the book, you use the term thumos, which means I, the way I read it was resolve, right? And so I'm going to ask, I guess this is a little bit of a political question, Brid, but you know, how do you judge the, the American public in terms of its willingness to go along with your strategy? Do, you know, is, 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 have you thought about sort of connecting that? You know, where, where, where is the resolve and the commitment as it relates to what your strategy would require? Well, I've thought a lot about it, um, more in the abstract than in, than in, but I've been doing, actually, I've been doing a lot of like radio 
uh, out, out across the country uh, as part of this. And, mm -hmm. and that's been, you know, kind of one of the one of the more um, rewarding parts is to is to engage with outside of the sort of the blob or what have you and, and with sort of, yeah. you know, normal Americans, you know, not not policy wonks on, on, on that level. I mean, I think to step back from the Thumos point, resolve the central kind of point in the book, and this is this is this is really, you know, some kind of Clausewitzian idea. Resolve is a dynamic quality that depends on how war starts, who's perceived as the aggressor, you know, how the how the, the opponent behaves. The fact, uh, uh, tragically, that the Russians, have, whether deliberately or not, have been bombarding hospitals, for instance, that has resulted in a different mindset. And um, uh, not only in Ukraine, but I think throughout throughout the world that has an impact on the military situation because it makes both the Ukrainians and others prepared to do things they might not otherwise have been prepared to do. And so the idea in the book and the, the, the sort of focus on Thumos, Thumos is this I, sort of like in, intelligent passions, not passions in a kind of, it goes back at Plato and it's a bit pretentious, but, but I think it's a useful concept because it's, it, it's, it's this idea, you know, that, that in a war, passion matters. You know, when, when FDR got up in front of the Congress on February, excuse me, December 8th, 1941, he said, the American people in their righteous might, that is a thumotic statement. And the thumotic passion of the American people led to a very ferocious campaign against the Japanese over the subsequent three and a half years that in a sense, the Japanese brought upon themselves. And so this is, the book kind of tries to grapple this idea. I think in terms of the American people, I think we're actually seeing some of the thematic aspect right now, whereas I think there's a very strong and, and justifiable uh, strain in American life across the political spectrum that says we got in all these stupid wars and what do we have to show for it? And, you know, why do we listen to these blob people? They, they, they're they bad at their job. I mean, look, QED. And I actually think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, on the other hand, what you're seeing now is American people don't like to see barbaric atrocities and, you know, aggression by, uh, you know, one country against another that were, if not allied with, you know, linked with and as close to other countries that were allied with. Um, and I think, so, and, and, I mean, you know, I don't have a specific answer on, the, on, 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 on this or a specific point on, on what's happening right now in this, except to say this has to be part of our defense strategy and thinking and, and, and in, in, a, in an intentional way. We have to think about the thematic element, both for good in the sense of harnessing it to our own in our own interests, but also carefully that we don't get carried away um, in a way that I think some people are getting carried away. And in, in, for instance, you know, a no fly zone recommendation, which I think is profoundly irresponsible, um, you know, that, that you could say is maybe people are getting carried away by their their moral fervor. But I think we need to be more much more uh, uh, sort of uh, conscious and, 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 and sort of strong but prudent in how we think about this. Yeah, I want to ask a, a related question. Um, it's not in the book, but um, it occurred to me since reading, and it, it, I guess it's an Eisenhower question about the military industrial complex. And so, because we are at a moment, I think that, you know, where we sort of, there's definitely one chapter closed, another chapter open. It's rare that you can actually see this so clearly, but I think the you know, the end of the war in Afghanistan and so on was really, you know, a marker. And now we're opening a new chapter here, what's happening in Europe. And, um, but I'm thinking about, um, you know, you have such a unique view from sort of the Pentagon and, you know, in terms of, you know, okay, where, you know, what sort of procurement are we going to do? You know, like, what, you know, what are we going to spend on? And, um, you know, in, in from my perspective as a lay person, I see, okay, now we're going to do cyber war, we're going to do space war, we're going to do, yeah, there's sort of, you know, so if you wanted to be skeptical, um, you could say, well, here goes the military industrial complex, like we're going to, okay, just turn the page, new chapter, you know, all this new stuff. Um, have you thought about that at all in terms of, you know, just sort of proliferation, if you will, of, uh, and sort of ongoing, um, sort of uh, irrepressible sort of appetite of the military industrial complex to keep going. Yeah. I mean, I'm, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm around it. I've worked in it. So like, I, I mean, discount accordingly what I say, but um, I don't think the military industrial co complex per se, as in like defense companies mm -hmm. are that, um, 
much of a driving factor. Um, they are there, they're sort of an interest group, but in my experience, defense companies tend to be cautious. They're almost like extensions of the government. So I think you could say they definitely don't want to like lose share, but they tend to be nervous about, you know, like it's not like the defense companies are paying people to go out and advocate for new wars because mm -hmm. their interest is sort of like the quarterly earnings call stability. They're highly regulated industries. So they're very, they're very close, but it's kind of, it's more, probably more like, I don't know, it's like any big regulated industry. I guess what I would say is one of the things that I really try to do as a defense person, I, I, I at the end of the book, if you recall, I really, I'm, I'm, I try to work this out a little bit is yeah. I don't like to comment on what our levels of defense spending as a nation should be. Cause my view of the role of a defense strategy person is to say, well, look, here's the two problems. Here are the interests out there. Here's what we have. Here's what we should do. Here are different things that you could do and levels of security that you could have. And then sort of say, what do you want American people? Now, I mean, in practice, I think some level of, of increase in real defense is just necessary for like the basic, I mean, according to say, you know, very credible figures like Mattis and Dunford and Bob Bork, like we need three to five real growth, percent real growth in the defense budget just to kind of keep up with inflation, operating and maintenance costs. But I'm not out there. And there are a lot of people in my line of work who are out there being like, we should double the defense budget. And my view is like, well, um, a kind of like do your job. Like the American people give us a lot of money in the defense world. Over 3% of our income every year is go to this national security establishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, can't we do better, you know? So, so, okay, let's see what we can do within the program and, and sort of what I'm, what I did in the Pentagon, tried to do in the Pentagon and what in, in the book is like, okay, within the, you know, given the threats in the world, China, Russia, here's, you know, others, terrorism, here are the things, uh, you know, here are the things we need to worry about. Here are the military strategies that I think are going to be, you know, plausible given the American people's costs and risk tolerance. Um, and then, you know, it's for others to say, in a sense, how far we want to go. So in the end of the book, I say the three core missions, that non-negotiable missions of the U.S. armed forces should be one, leading an anti-hegemonic coalition in Asia, which means if basically defending Taiwan with a strategy of denial, which is the demanding military standard. Okay, that's one, because if we get that, then we can defend Japan, Australia, and Philippines, and then the coalition will work, and we won't be in a situation where China dominates half of global GDP and can coerce us in our national life. Okay, that's one. That's expensive. Two is a nuclear deterrent that's sufficient to deal with both China and Russia. And the reason for that is I don't want, it's my view, I don't think the American people should ever be subject to grand nuclear coercion. At the, you know, that's the fundamental interest. And by the way, we can extend that umbrella to our allies and that has imposes some additional costs. But, and then the third is a lower cost ongoing counterterrorism effort because we don't want another 9-11. It seems to me we should pay for that. You know, none of us wants to go through that again who lived through it. Um, and that's part of the cost. And of course, some of that's intelligence and State Department and police and CBP and all that. But, but those are three things. That's th those are the things that I would say we absolutely should, and and that we should reshape our military to do those things. And our military is not shaped to do those things. So my first call call would be do that first, and then ask for extra money. The the, the fourth mission that I think the American people could reasonably want more. And I if 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 you were asking me, I would want to provide some capability is to help NATO defend itself against Russian assault mm -hmm. simultaneously, effectively, because we can't use the same things in two different places at a time. But the good news is that the Europeans can take a much larger share of that effort, particularly the conventional forces in Europe. So we're the kind of like high end provider, if you will. But that's that's basically it. So my and, and there's a lot of my friends, I'm Republican, a lot of my friends on the, on the Republican side say, hey, we just increase defense budget and we'll, we'll be fine. We can do everything like it's the old days, like we're George W. Bush time. No, 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 that's fake. That's, that's, that is a falsehood. Even if we increase defense spending, we are still going to have to make hard choices because the scale of what particularly China can do is so great. And by the way, in addition, a lot of those increase, like for instance, this year's budget, a lot of that's going to go just to in covering inflation. So we're not going to get like real significant increases. Also spending takes time to kick in. And then finally, are the American people ready to spend? I don't know, I, I, maybe a bit more, you know, but my view is we should also get our allies to spend a lot more. It's inexcusable that the Japanese are spending 1% of GDP on defense while we spend 3%. That's insane. So I think our job as defense people is to say, well, let's get our allies on track. And finally, that's happening in Europe. 
But that's kind of how I, I look at the problem. And then it's up, it's just up to the American people and their representatives to say, okay, I see what you're saying. I don't want to take that risk. I want more comfort. Okay. You know, plus X percent. Okay. That's got it. But let's, my job is not, my job is to lay it out and, and give it to people in, in clear terms, I think. So that's great. And you, you conclude the book with a chapter called A Decent Peace. Um, it's a sort of a coda to the book. And I, I wanted, to, before we conclude, for you to say a little bit about that sort of goal and how you see it. And maybe just to put a little spin on the question, um, you know, we're sitting here on the east side of New York. We're near, near the United Nations. And, you know, it's the UN has been sort of in and out of this most recent conflict. So I guess my question is, maybe you could say a little bit about how you view this concept of a decent peace. And then, you know, where where do you think, you know, as Americans from a defense and foreign policy perspective should be thinking about international institutions. And to tie it back to Morgenthau for just a second, if you remember in the Politics Among Nations, he does the last section of the book is about diplomacy, right? I mean, he comes back to diplomacy. He doesn't he doesn't just leave it aside. So be interested in any comments that you might have about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what differentiates me from a lot who are, I don't like the term hawk, I don't consider myself a hawk, but because Sometimes somebody should be a hawk. Sometimes you should be a dove. It depends on the context. But um, some people who are also on kind of harder line on the China, China issue right now, they're basically for regime change. They say we can't live with the Communist Party. I don't agree with that. I think we can have a decent peace with a, even a, a China run by Xi Jinping. I don't like him. I don't like I wouldn't want to live under it. I feel very I feel bad. But should we fight a war over it? No, no, it's not. It's not not necessary for the American people to die in large numbers for that goal. Um, in my view. And uh, so that, what is the end goal? An end goal is a stable balance of power in which the Chinese are an adaptive balance of power in which the Chinese are compelled to respect us and our allies and partners' interests. And of course, that's going to be a variable exactly what that is, but that would allow detente. I'm not looking for regime change. I'm not looking for the dismemberment and humiliation of China. And I've actually made this point to Chinese is that this is, I think this, this end goal is consistent with, with China being one of the two superpowers of the world. That's pretty great. Like you can't dominate everybody. You're not going to be the middle kingdom of the whole world, but you'll be a middle kingdom. You'll be essentially, and there'll be sort of a sphere mm -hmm. and we can trade across that divide with restrictions. Um, but it's sort of a trust, but verify kind of not trust, but verify is probably not the right word, but sort of live, but verify, if you will coexist, but verify, um, but coexist, but defend yourself robustly and stoutly, I guess would be sort of the idea. Um, but I think that's, 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 and that's, that's, again, that goal of realism, which is to correlate, you know, what we're prepared to do. I mean, I think Morgenthau had a great line. I love it. It's, I think it's from, and I'm not sure it's from where it's from, but he said, the purpose of our military is to make it clear to our opponents, basically potential opponents that, that it, it, it is irrational for them to use military force because we have the ability to rationally employ our military force. And that's sort of the basic logic of this book. Mm -hmm. is that we have a rational way of employing our military that they then can see would lead to more costs than, than is worth it for them to use their military. And then they decide to go in another direction because Xi Jinping is in high dudgeon these days. He's bumptious, he's, he's aggressive, but you know, if he runs up and if, if it proves to be a poor strategy in the future, they'll adapt and they'll say, well, you know, I would have loved to have dominated the Western Pacific, but I, it's not worth it. So I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to adjust my policy. And that's sort of the, 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 the basic logic. And, and diplomacy is critical. And I'd really commend the work of my partner, Wes Mitchell, who I think is, I'm thinking more about the military end of this stuff, but he's thinking about the diplomacy side. And diplomacy is critical, but it's a different kind of diplomacy than I think we have been practicing in the unipolar era, which is almost a form of like <laughs> instruction or sort of a missionary kind of like administration you know, among, out in the world. This is this is high diplomacy of the traditional kind, which is understanding power and the threat of force and arraying things appropriately in order to avoid that 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 outcome. And that I think is what we, we essentially need that diplomacy. But actually, we're really out of practice. I mean, maybe not all of the, you know, the, the celebrity aspects It's something more like Kissinger and, and Nixon, that that model of thinking, OK, I mean, Okay, like here's where the world is going. Here's what our interests suggest. Well, you know, huh? Let's change how we're doing things. You know, Guam doctrine, opening to China, other things. That's that's what that is actually exactly what we need. Well, I would like to encourage you and Wes and your colleagues to write another book. 
Um, you know, I, I do think that there is a there is a sequel here. Uh, you know, uh, picking up um, from where you where you left off. So, um, thank you so much for sharing this time with us and for you know going deeper into the book. Um, I commend it to everybody. I can't resist. I want to conclude by reading one of the blurbs uh, that appears on the back of the book. Uh, from our mutual friend, uh, Bob Kaplan, um, who calls your book an exceptional book on defense strategy that reaches theoretical mastery akin to Hans Morgenthau's Politics Among Nations. There's no better guidebook to how we should think about war and peace in this new age of great power competition. So I agree with Bob. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, for wonderful to be with you. Thanks, Bridge. Thanks so much. Thank See you. you